Okay, we're back. We have a second lecture by Professor Stephen Backus, and this one will be about ultrasound and stimulation and modulation in the nervous system. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Kim. Uh, so yes, I'll be talking about uh, how ultrasound can interact with and stimulate the nervous system. In general, when we think about um, um, perturbing the nervous system, um, there's um, uh, a number of ways we can think about it. First, let me just give you an overview about what I'll be talking about today. I'll be talking about the overall concept of ultrasound neuro neurostimulation, in particular, uh, talking about when we perturb the nervous system, you know, how is it going to interact with the nervous system in an information um, processing um, sort of way? You know, how does it change the signals that are being processed and transmitted in the nervous system, the neural coding aspects? I'll also be talking about mechanisms of ultrasonic neurostimulation. There's a lot of ways to perturb the nervous system. You can perturb molecules, genes, synaptic transmission, behavior, uh, perception, uh, uh, cellular activity. In, in general, the, it's important to know if you're going to be perturbing the nervous system, what is the reason you're doing that? Uh, the goals can be for understanding the information processing, understanding biophysical mechanisms, how they work, not only the biophysical mechanisms that are, are, are activated by the perturbation method, but understanding biophysical mechanisms in general understanding what the neural computations are in the nervous system, uh, giving theoretical explanations, you know, why is the nervous system working the way that, that it is? All of these things can be benefited by perturbing the nervous system and techniques such as knocking out genes, um, blocking synaptic transmission, blocking certain receptors have been used uh, to great advantage for the purpose of understanding. In addition, uh, perturbing the nervous system also can potentially be useful for treating diseases, such as Parkinson's disease in the case of deep brain stimulation. A newer idea such as uh, being able to correct conditions such as depression and PTSD, which previously were thought about as molecular disorders, now being thought about more as uh, disorders of the, of the circuitry and the connections of the brain, that one can perturb those connections and potentially treat the disease. Uh, diseases of activity such as epilepsy and cognitive diseases such as al uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, perturbing the nervous system in some way, hopefully to bring about a cure is, is an important goal. As to the uh, methods of perturbing the nervous system, there have been many, uh, many of them. I mentioned pharmacology, the ability to block specific types of neurotransmission, electrical stimulation to be able to activate or silence different parts of the brain. Uh, more recently, optical stimulation to be able to, under genetic control, use light to activate or silence particular neurons. And uh, also transcranial magnetic stimulation, which can be used in humans as a non-invasive way to, uh, to activate the brain. Now, all of these have different uh, advantages and, and, and different disadvantages. For example, uh, you might think of as pharmacology and uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation is as being non-invasive. Uh, pharmacology, you have to give a, a drug to an animal or a person, but you don't have to put any device inside of them, whereas electrical stimulation or optical stimulation would be more, more invasive. So the non-invasiveness, for example, of uh, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, is, is, is definitely uh, um, useful. But, um, but there's a limitation in that that technique can only reach down uh, 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 so far, there's a depth limitation. So uh, really only the, the cortical structures are, are uh, um, um, under access by this technique and deeper structures wouldn't be. But ultrasound has its own particular uh, set of benefits in that it can uh, penetrate the, the skull, uh, be directed anywhere into the brain. Uh, it has some limitations in terms of a scale. You'd be able to activate a very uh, small uh, region of the brain by invasive electrical stimulation, but the non-invasiveness of ultrasound is uh, is really of, of great of great benefit. And also the fact that ultrasound is a very well developed technology, already people uh, use it for uh, imaging uh, throughout th throughout the body. And if we can you know, uh, develop this technique to be able to stimulate or modulate the nervous system, then we can take advantage of that ability to focus and um, uh, uh, to, to focus and deliver ultrasounds uh, throughout the body. So uh, the ability of ultrasound to change activity in the nervous system has actually been known uh, for quite some time. I'm showing a 1958 reference here, but it was even known some decades before that. So in this, uh, in this figure here, this paper uh, from, uh, from Fry, a uh, well-known paper, uh, what was done is to stimulate the, the, the thalamus, the first um, uh, visual synapse after the retina. 
And in this case, uh, the goal was to apply sort of longer term stimulation and then look some minutes after the stimulation. It wasn't really an acute immediate effect of the stimulus, uh, but you can see that in a control case, there's a, a visual stimulus applied and there's some electrical activity measured, which you can just take as the, as the, uh, the amplitude of this extracellular uh, electrical measurement. And then after a stimulation with ultrasound, some minutes afterward, tens of minutes, there was a, um, a depression of activity, which then recovered over time. But it was really in the last little more than a decade that that ultrasound was found, found to be able to kind of modulate in a very rapid dynamic way activity in the nervous system. So Jamie Tyler discovered that ultrasound that delivered to nervous tissue here, this is a recording from a slice in a dish, can be used to very rapidly evoke spiking activity, you know, looking in some ways as, as to what you would see if you gave an electrical stimulus to a, a, part, of the, a part of the brain nervous tissue. And, and after those uh, initial studies, uh, it really, uh, you know, um, reinvigorated interest in this area, really generated interest in this, this area because it was never really a very, a very uh, a focused area of study. To be able to try to understand how ultrasound can be used to stimulate and modulate um, activity in, in the nervous system. And so since then, uh, there have been many studies in many parts of the, the nervous system, both in vitro and in vivo, about how ultrasound can modify neural activity. In general, we still don't understand all about how it works. And there's some, been some limitations about, you know, uh, how we can understand the, the biophysical mechanisms and understand where it's acting in the nervous system. Um, as, uh, as an example of some of those studies that have been done, they've been all done from uh, all the way from in vitro up to humans. Uh, so this study by uh, Sung Sik who I believe you'll be hearing from later in the course, is uh, as a study stimulating the somatosensory cortex um, uh, through, uh, through a focused transducer. Uh, and uh, subjects uh, who are awake uh, are asked to report what they feel. And in this case, for, uh, for a dozen patients, um, nearly all of them uh, reported that when their somatosensory cortex was stimulated, they felt some sensations. And they seem to be localized in, in their hand for reasons that are, are not fully, fully understood. It may be that the, the, um, uh, the hand region is just a very sensitive uh, area of the, of the somatosensory cortex, and, and, and that's the one that got activated. One difficulty with all these sorts of studies is that even though um, uh, ultrasound can be focused and skull aberrations can be measured and attempts can be corrected for. In, in most of the studies that are published, it's not clear exactly you know, where the target structure is relative to the ultrasound field. Uh, because of things like skull aberrations when in going uh, non-invasively through the skull, there can be all, all sorts, of, uh, sorts of effects, uh, including um, you know, uh, the defocusing of the stimulus, including standing waves. And so, you know, understanding exactly where the ultrasound field is relative to the target structure, what, is the, what are the biophysical mechanisms, um, you know, what, what is the, the interaction with ultrasound and, and natural, natural uh, stimuli that are being carried uh, in, in the brain. Because of all these uncertainties, you know, even though there's a lot of tantalizing results, we don't have a, a complete picture of how ultrasound causes these uh, effects of, uh, of activity or suppression or modulation of neural activity. So in the first section, I'm gonna be talking about you know, you know, getting into this idea of trying to understand how ultrasound might interact with information processing. What information can be transmitted by ultrasound and how does stimulation modulate other signals, natural signals that are going on in the nervous system. My laboratory studies the retina, the first step in visual processing. And um, the retina as a whole has been a, a very uh, accessible structure for us to understand how information is processed, how mechanisms are combined together to perform uh, functions of, of, in this case, visual processing, uh, neural computations that, uh, that are used by the nervous system. And in the same way, we found that it's been a very useful test bed to understand how ultrasound is working and how ultrasound is interacting with the nervous system. So to give you a brief overview of the retina, you know, light comes through the front of the eye and is focused by a lens on the back of uh, the eye on, on the retina, which is a thin sheet of neural tissue about 120 or so microns thick. Uh, light uh, is absorbed by photoreceptors. 
Uh, the signals pass from photoreceptors to second order neurons bipolar cells, then to ganglion cells, which send ax op axons into the optic nerve. And along the way, they're modified by a, a, a couple of basic uh, main types of inhibitory interneurons, which we won't really be talking about that much. Okay? So we don't really need to get into the structure of the retina as of yet, just to understand that signals flow across a couple of synapses be before going into the optic nerve. So what I want you to do is consider you know, how signals are uh, represented and transmitted in the nervous system, because that's important to understand how they're gonna change if they're gonna be perturbed by some external stimulus. What I'm showing you here is re repeated presentations of a, a natural stimulus, a, a, a movie, a video, uh, I believe it's trees waving in the breeze that are projected down onto the retina. And these are recordings of electrical signals in retinal ganglion cells. So each row here is a different trial. Each little blue dot here is a uh, action potential or spike produced by a retinal ganglion cell. The responses of the retina are very precise. If you proceed, repeat the same stimulus, you'll get almost uh, exactly the same pattern of spikes. There's some noise, they vary a little bit. Their timing is pretty, uh, uh, you know, pretty regular. Uh, individual action potentials can jitter back and forth uh, by a few milliseconds or tens of milliseconds or so. But overall, if you uh, uh, create what's called a peristimulus time histogram, uh, looking, um, you know, basically averaging over the spike rate and putting them in time bins, you can see that this firing rate is, is, very, is very precise. Each individual ganglion cell has its own little view, its own receptive field. Uh, facing out to the world. So different cells shown in different colors and different rows here have different responses to the scene. And depending on the direction they look and depending on the type of ganglion cell, the type of visual features that the cell is sensitive to, you get different patterns of action potentials. And those patterns are the ones that are interpreted by the brain. That's, that's the only information that your brain gets about the visual world. And interpreta interpretation of those spike patterns is how you can recognize, uh, recognize objects and, and uh, make visual decisions. Steve, are these, uh, all of these spike patterns time locked to some sort of <clears throat> visual stimulus or is this spontaneously organized? Yeah, no, this, this is when I say repeating a, the same identical stimulus. So the time indicates the time in the movie. So a movie mm -hmm. is being presented at 30 or so seconds long, and the movie starts at a certain time, and the, the registration of the action potentials are made uh, at exactly the same time relative to the movie. So this little repeated burst of spikes here means that something happened, you know, uh, an object moved or the, the scene changed a little bit. And whenever that happens at, at this very precise period of time, you know, let's say a darkening of the visual, the, the local visual scene, this cell fired a spike. I see. So ganglion cells make what's called a mosaic. So a ganglion cell of a certain type is uh, um, uh, tiled in a regular array across the retina. So it's, it's like the optic nerve is receiving um, you know, a different processed pattern of the visual scene. There's maybe 20 or more types of retinal ganglion cells. So it's like 20 or so parallel representation of the image that your brain interprets. So in terms of understanding uh, the neural code, how the nervous system represents sort of some external feature of the world, because of this precision and the accessibility of the retina, it's been a way that we can really understand how signals are represented, how they're translated into the optic nerve, how the cells and synapses perform visual computation, such as picking out certain visual features, such as motion or edges. The way we perform such experiments is by taking the retina out of the animal. And that's another nice, very uh, useful thing about the retina is that it functions basically the same way that it does in a dish as it does in the animal. We're not slicing the retina, we are cutting the optic nerve, but when we you know, bathe it in physiological saline and project an image down onto the retina, it's really responding the same way as it does. You know, so we've done experiments in salamanders and mice, and I'll be talking about salamanders experiments, salamander experiments today. So we put the retina in a dish. So G are the ganglion cells that make up the optic nerve. And they sit on what's called a multi-electrode array, which is a glass slide with wires embedded in it that based on just their physical proximity to the retinal ganglion cells, they can record electrical activity like those spikes that I just showed you. They were recorded with a multi-electrode array. Uh, the visual stimulus can be uh, projected down onto the, onto the retina and we can control the natural input to the retina simply by controlling pixels on a video monitor. <clears throat> 
We can do things like lower in, uh, intracellular electrodes down to individual interneurons. We can also optically imaging uh, image with uh, two photon microscopy electrical activity in individual cells. So this is a sort of a standard kind of preparation that we have used and we modified it to be able to deliver ultrasound essentially just by uh, replacing a, a microscope objective with an ultrasound transducer. So from a, a, a regular type of experiment, when we project light onto the retina, we would record with a multi-electrode array, an array of 60 electrodes, signals that look like this. Here, this is a slightly different representation that I showed you before. Here, each row is a different cell, recording from, let's say, something like 50 cells or so, and it's one uh, single you know, four-second presentation of, uh, of a movie. So by replacing ultrasound transducer with a, a re replacing a microscope objective with an ultrasound transducer, we can deliver ultrasound to the retina and then we can record the electrical activity. And often, also if we want, we can uh, image with a two, two, photon, um, two photon microscope, both either visual stimulus and the two photon, um, um, uh, the infrared laser uh, coming from below. Uh, this is work done by uh, uh, Mike Mentz in my lab, also in collaboration with the lab of Pierre uh, Kuria Kub with postdocs uh, Omar El Ralkin and Amin Nikuzade. Okay, now, so I want to first talk generally about the structure of ultrasound stimuli that have been used for the nervous system. Okay, whenever you re read a paper about an ultrasound neurostimulation, uh, you should really you know, immediately look at the stimulus structure because they can vary greatly from paper to paper. Uh, and there's little standardization. And in some, in some cases, um, it's not clear why people chose the stimuli that they did. So it's really something that, uh, that one should pay attention to. Now at the bottom here, the backbone of the stimulus is a carrier wave of, uh, of ultrasound. Uh, the frequency is typically between 0.1 and 50 megahertz or so, depending on whether the stimulus is being delivered through the skull, those stimuli are generally uh, one megahertz or less. Since we have a retina in a dish, and generally in vivo experiments are free to explore higher ranges of frequency so they can we can we and others can use both high and low frequency in a dish okay. so then the carrier wave is often multiply uh, uh, modulated by some intermediate frequency usually called a pulse rep repetition frequency so these are often pulses that range from 100 uh, uh, hertz up to uh, kilohertz or, or, or tens of kilohertz or so. What that means is that this carrier wave if you were to zoom in here on these pulses you would see this carrier wave are being modulated here in general, it's not been clear why people use these pulse, uh, pulse repetition frequencies. Uh, um, uh, in some cases, it's probably just they try it and that's, and that's why it works. Um, uh, in our case, we've generally found that this isn't necessary. Um, I think in, in general, it would, be, it would be helpful to have greater parametric explorations of this, uh, this and really all range of, of stimuli to understand what is effective and what's not. Because generally what you see is that people just, just choose something and, and, and report it. One potential difficulty with these intermediate frequencies is that they are generally in the audible range. And so if you have a, a stimulus that is modulated at these you know, uh, one kilohertz frequencies, potentially there are audible effects that can stimulate uh, an animal or potentially humans. And it's actually been shown in some cases in mice that, uh, that these, this intermediate range of, uh, of audible uh, frequencies can, can be heard. So in general, uh, you know, I would say that uh, this is a region, region to be cautious about. There's, there's potentially ways where you can avoid those auditory uh, effects. But, um, but since I have said that um, in general, people don't motivate their choices well, um, it's, um, this is a range of frequencies that one, one should be careful about. So then at the, uh, at the lower end, lowest end, what you'll often typically see are some uh, uh, range of modulation of biological frequencies. That might be a half hertz up to 100 hertz or so, similar to the range of nat natural stimuli, such as you know, uh, flickering, uh, uh, flickering lights or modulation of sound. Um, uh, that um, you know, the, the envelope of sound, let's say, or mechanosensory stimuli, uh, or um, um, electrical stimuli that would be give or, given uh, directly to uh, to neurons. So this biological range is certainly important, and uh, you know that is the really the 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 uh, the important um, I know modulatory range of the of the signals that is is really activated and, and controlling the nervous system. So, for example, for visual stimuli, uh, um, the range would be 
um, of, of natural frequency would be in this range of, you know, um, uh, half hertz or a little less than that, uh, up to some tens of hertz. And so that's the range of, of, uh, of frequencies that, that, uh, that animals are sensitive to. And so that range of modulation is certainly, is certainly important. Another parameter that um, can be used to vary the stimulus is a duty cycle, meaning that if you have a pulse stimulus, then that stimulus can be pulsed, but at a very low duty cycle, it's only being on, let's say, 10% of the time, or 50% of the time, or almost on, um, on, on almost all the time, 90% of the time. Okay. This duty cycle could be uh, applied to this intermediate pulse frequency or the lower frequency modulation. So as you can see, there's a range of parameters that one can vary. You know, even before one gets into a spatial focusing of the ultrasound stimuli, and this range of parameters has not really been fully explored, and it's uh, and this is ongoing work. All right. So in our work in the retina, what we've done is to choose a very high frequency, forty-three megahertz, because it allow, allows us to get to a, a very localized stimulus, uh, let's say of a hundred micron spot or so, with a focused transducer. And we found that this intermediate range of frequencies of tens of kilohertz is really not relevant at all. Whether we, whether we add that in or, or whether we uh, leave it out, what really matters is the, is the power integrated over a, a slower uh, timescale, uh, over the, this sort of biological timescale of 0.5 to 15 hertz that's relevant to um, um, salamanders um, or, or mice. Uh, also, that's a similar range to what would be sensitive in, in humans, although humans could go up to somewhat a higher frequency. Steve, I'm curious, what's the bandwidth on that transducer that you use? The bandwidth, so this is a transducer from the Korea Yakub lab, and um, uh, you mean the over, over which it can be modulated, and I, I know, I think it can be uh, varied up to uh, 50 megahertz or so. I'm not sure how low it can go. That's not really something we've done that much. I think we'd have to uh, contact them to to um, um, to see that. And certainly, even with fixed transducers, there is some range of modulation, and so uh, we've often um, you know, explored frequency by changing the transducers, which experimentally is a little bit more difficult because you have to, uh, you know, change out the transducer often not in the same prep. But the range that you can explore in a, in a single prep is, is really a useful thing to do because you're controlling for everything else. So we've done some of that variation in collaboration with members of your lab in the lower frequency. But for these higher frequencies, we've generally stuck with a fixed frequency. So relative to the width of the retina, this is a stimulus that spans the entire retina. So even though it's localized uh, in 100 microns or so, and the retina is much wider, several millimeters, millimeters, it's really stimulating the entire retina. Steve, I think you're you're probably going to get to this point, but I'll just bring it up ahead of time anyway. Um, most people, you know, in the class, they know by now that you need lower frequencies to get through the human skull, and I know some people might say. Uh, well, you know, if we're only going to use uh, less than a megahertz, um, why is using 43 megahertz relevant? Yeah, so we'll talk about that uh, because we don't know really what the frequency dependence is for, um, for lots of things, for all sorts of mechanisms. And it may be that, um, um, you know, there's one sort of physical theory that will span all frequencies. And I would say that would be great. And therefore, we should go across all frequencies that are, are you know, feasible to val validate that theory. Okay. Um, the other thing to think about is that uh, stimuli don't always have to be through the skull. So in the case of uh, retinal applications, then you could easily pass 43 megahertz through the eye for a non-invasive retinal prosthesis, and that's an application that we're thinking about. There's also a potential for use of, um, of subcranial implants that are very thin and can, can stay upon the, the, the um, um, uh, the brain outside the dura even, that could potentially reach deeper into the brain. And so that would be sort of semi-invasive below the skull, but wouldn't need to penetrate the, the dura. Uh, there would be also be other sort of basic science and in vitro applications where, you know, you have a, a piece of neural tissue and you want to use this, this very high frequency localized single cell kind of stimulation to be able to kind of randomly access and move around the tissue. So I would say there's all sorts of potential applications. And it's true that maybe one, th uh, a theory of one frequency range won't apply to the other, uh, but maybe it does and we don't know as of yet. But I'll talk about those comparisons a bit later. So one thing that we can do with our retinal preparation is compare the natural method of, of, uh, of um, 
uh, excitation of the visual stimulus with the artificial um, method of, of stimulation and do so in the same preparation. So here we're taking a, a visual spot, which is a similar size to, to the ultrasound spot and focusing a light down onto the retina. And so you can see that when the light turns on and off over about a half second or so, uh, ganglion cells again fire very reproducible spikes. So these are, are brief bursts of spikes that align up just about at the same time. When we turn on an ultrasound stimulus, we see something very similar. So these are pulses of ultrasound in the same uh, uh, a half, half hertz uh, frequency on and then off. And we see spikes driven in the retinal ganglion cells without the visual stimuli. And they're just about as precise or even more precise as the visual stimuli. Looking at the firing rate over time here, this is a, another uh, uh, peristimulus time histogram showing the firing rate in small bins of time of about 10 milliseconds or so. And you can see the ultrasound bursts are just about as precise as the visual bursts and the latency is a little bit shorter. You can compare the ultrasound latency and visual latency. And as I said, you can see in response to the onset and offset of the, of the stimulus, the ultrasound latency is a little bit shorter. And we think that's because we're effectively bypassing the phototransduction mechanisms. Um, ultrasound is more directly activating cells, whereas a visual stimulus has to go through a biochemical cascade of photons being detected and activating a sequence of protein and biochemical reactions. The jitter of um, now the ultrasound stimulus is on about the same scale. This is a, a, a normalized a temporal standard deviation of ultrasound versus visual stimulation. One means the temporal jitter, the temporal variation is, uh, is the same. And this uh, histogram straddles one, meaning that overall the, the temporal jitter is, is very similar. So it's possibly to, possible to activate the retina with, uh, with very, um, um, activate the retina very precisely using ultrasound. Okay. So, even though this is sort of a proof of principle, we like to know whether ultrasound can really be used to transmit a high bandwidth information. Can it really be used to generate those patterns of spikes in the same way that we saw with the visual stimulus? Okay. So the way we did that was to sort of use a, was, was to use a standard technique of what we've used to understand visual stimulation to give a uh, randomly varying what's called white noise stimulus, uh, collect the spikes that come from this white noise stimulus and build a model of how the retina is activated over time by the randomly flickering stimulus. And that model includes two, two parts. One that describes the average temporal response. You can think of this linear filter as an average response to a brief flash of light or a, or a photon, showing that on, on average during this randomly flickering visual stimulus, cells decrease their firing rate and then increase their firing rate over a time interval of about 100 milliseconds or so. Um, the way we think about this model is that um, if each photon were to cause on average this response, then if you were to consider what's called a linear model, okay, uh, summing all of those independent effects from each photon, what we would do is to take the stimulus and convolve it with a uh, filter, a temporal filter that looks like this. That gives us a linear approximation of how a linear cell would respond if all of those photons were having independent effects that were then summed together. Okay. The output of this linear filter then is passed through a function that we fit called a, a nonlinearity, a static nonlinearity, which is a threshold function that um, captures the fact that the stimulus has to be strong enough to cross a threshold and then the cells will fire. So the linear filter captures the average temporal response, the average temporal weighting or filtering over the stimulus and the nonlinearity uh, capture such aspects as threshold, sensitivity and the slope of the nonlinearity and any saturation, which we would see up here at the end, but we don't see in this, in this model. With this model, we apply a white noise stimulus, we collect the spikes and the standard technique is called reverse correlation. We're correlating the stimulus over time with the response. And then we compute this linear filter. And then based on this linearly filtered prediction, then we compute the best fit nonlinearity. So this linear, this linear nonlinear or LN model as it's called, gives us a compact representation of the neural code. The linear filter represents what is the, what is the temporal visual feature of the stimulus that the cell is most sensitive to and the nonlinearity tells us about its threshold and sensitivity. So we can do thing, the same thing with visual and ultrasound stimuli. Okay. So here's a comparison in the same cell of a visual filter. This is the, this, a negative going phase of the visual filter means on average, when the light got brighter, the cell reduced its firing rate. So this would be called an off cell. When the light gets brighter, the cell reduces its firing rate. When the light gets dimmer, the cell increases its firing rate. 
and we see a completely reasonable looking uh, uh, filter from ultrasound. It has a different uh, shape. It looks uh, a little bit more what's called uh, you know, differentiating than the more monophasic uh, visual filter. So the time course is different, but <clears throat> this, um, uh, the time course of this ultrasound filter shows us that uh, there is a temporal feature that the cell is sensitive to, in this case, a temporal feature of ultrasound. This sharp threshold nonlinearity, once again, shows us something that's completely expected. If the stimulus is too weak, the cell will not fire. If it's stronger below, uh, above a threshold, the cell will fire. And the stronger the, the stimulus is, the firing rate increases more and more with sort of roughly a, a linear relationship above threshold. Other kinds of cells have other responses. Some cells respond more when the light goes on, increasing their firing rate. In this case, uh, the same was true of the cell responding to ultrasound. When the ultrasound intensity became higher, the cell increased its firing rate. Here in this case, the sensitivity to ultrasound was a little less, the slope is shallower, but since we're not really norm <coughs> normalizing the, um, um, in any way, the ultrasound stimulus with the visual stimulus, the slopes aren't really comparable. We can compare the peak frequency of ultrasound versus visual stimulation. And in this case, we see that the ultrasound stimulation has a, had a higher peak frequency sensitivity than to visual stimuli. So this really tells us that we're you know, delivering uh, temporal information in a, in a similar kind of time scale and bandwidth as to what we could do with visual information. There's another question that's important to ask in any kind of uh, uh, you know, external perturbation. You, know, you might be able to modulate or, or activate the nervous system, but it's also important to know how is the nervous system behaving to its ongoing normal activity? Is it suddenly kind of ignoring everything that's going on in the brain? Is it becoming more sensitive to what else is going on in the nervous, in, in the brain? And so it's a separate question that is, is very often quite not asked, uh, but it's one that we address here. So in this case, instead of modulating the ultrasound stimuli in this random way, we're doing the usual experiment of modulating the visual stimulus. And so in this way, we can, again, compute a linear nonlinear model to visual stimuli, and then act, ask how that is affected by the ultrasound stimulus. What we wanna ask is how the sensitivity to visual stimuli is modulated or mod modified by ultrasound. So in response to ultrasound, when the stimulus goes on and off, here we see a decrease in firing rate and an increase in firing rate of this cell that then comes back down to baseline. Okay. In the different periods of time in a control and the on and the off period, we compute visual filters and we see that they're almost identical. So we see that even though the firing rate is being modified a great deal by ultrasound, the sensitivity to the visual stimulus isn't really changing very much in terms of its temporal pattern. We do see that the, the absolute sensitivity is changing. The threshold is similar but when the ultrasound goes on, because as illustrated by this decrease in firing rate, the slope of this nonlinearity is more shallow. And so that means that even though the temporal sensitivity is the same, the temporal pattern, the visual feature, let's say, that the cell is responding to is staying the same, the overall sensitivity is decreasing. Whereas when the ultrasound uh, turns off, it, the sensitivity transiently increases and then comes back down to baseline. Okay? So this tells us that uh, the sensitivity to the normal ongoing input uh, doesn't really change in terms of the temporal pattern, but its overall absolute sensitivity is, is modified. In terms of this change in slope, we can think about it as a, as a change in gain. That, um, that is varied by uh, the ultrasound and it's different for different cells. In some cells, the, the gain, uh, gain goes up a little bit, some cells it goes down a little bit, but, uh, and so there is a range. But uh, overall, the result that we see is the same. The temporal features don't really change that much, but the sensitivity does. And this is probably, you know, there could be different applications. In some case, you might, you know, want to shut down a brain region completely. And so you don't want to just um, cause a modification of its activity. You want it to be silenced to its normal input. In other cases, you might want to raise or lower the activity or sensitivity, but have the cells, you know, um, maintain their ongoing sensitivity. So in other words, if you 
uh, if you were, let's say, uh, modifying the motor cortex in some way, becoming, uh, you know, uh, uh, making it more active, you you might not want to silence the all of the natural inputs. You might you might want to, you know, to elevate the um, the activity, maybe lower the threshold, but still have the motor cortex be sensitive to all of the motor commands that are going on. So there there might be different applications that one would want. Steve, are there any specific uh, retinal disorders that you might want to just enhance firing, something with like myelination or signal transfer? Most of the retina, retinal disorders we have thought about are um, ones where the photoreceptors are lost. And so, um, you know, effectively you're replacing the visual stimulation by artificial stimulation. Uh, however, um, you know, there may be um, cases where there are, um, uh, you know, diseases where some, some cells start to die off. And so you just sort of want to elevate, uh, the, the sensitivity. And so there are a number of, uh, uh, number of, uh, diseases of, uh, of retinal generation, uh, typically, um, uh, genetic conditions where, uh, where bipolar cells, for example, become either, or either are not sensitive or are less sensitive. Okay, so now I want to transition to considering what are the possible physical mechanisms or the possible mechanisms of ultrasound stimulation, ultrasonic neurostimulation. And that's really a big mystery. You know, what is really being activated? And I want to divide those mechanisms into sort of two kind of classes, one being the physical mechanism. And by physical mechanism is, you know, sort of ignoring the biology for just a second. What is the uh, the mode of energy that's really being sensed. Is it thermal energy? Is it mechanical uh, energy? Uh, even that really isn't entirely known. So there's the physical mechanism. You might all, all, also call that the physical effect. And then there's the biophysical mechanism. You know, what are the, the um, uh, you know, biological uh, components? Uh, ion channels, membranes, synaptic vesicles. So here we want to focus first on just the physical mechanisms. Absorption of temperature may have such effects as uh, opening channels that also might change the capacitance of the membrane. An effect called cavitation, the formation of bubbles, might cause a mechanical effect that could act on, uh, act on channels or let's say disrupt the membrane. And another effect uh, that I think, I think you've heard about called radiation force, where uh, the absorption or uh, uh, attenuation of uh, an ultrasonic wave causes the delivery of momentum, which applies a force to um, uh, the nervous system, which can cause, let's say, bending of the membrane, opening of channels, uh, potentially fusing of vesicles. And so these are potentially, you know, different physical effects. And uh, there's been uh, a fair amount of debate and, and, and different um, experiments that have supported uh, different types of mechanisms. And so we, we have some evidence in the retina as to, uh, as to which one it is that I'll talk about, but it's, uh, but it's an on, ongoing question about which of these are, are going to be um, are the most important. And it very well may vary between preparations and between stimulus intensities and between acoustic frequencies. Steve, could you really quickly also comment on, because I mentioned this in the past, the retina versus uh, like brain tissue? Um, I'll, I'll, I will get, I will get uh, to that comparison. You will, okay, sounds good. Yep. Okay, so here's an experiment where we're imaging the, uh, the salamander retina. So this is a two photon uh, um, imaging uh, movie. So there's a fluorescent dye in the membranes. You're looking at sort of across um, um, uh, a lateral um, uh, a plane of the, of the, I'm gonna pause the movie for a little bit so I can, I can talk. Uh, um, you're looking at the plane of the retina and the light spot flashing on and off was the ultrasound turning on and off. And although the video is probably not transmitting at its uh, actual frame rate, you probably can see that there's some sort of motion uh, where there's some sort of expansion in the center. So this is stimulation at the normal frequencies, sorry, at the normal intensity that we see for, uh, for our neural activity. And we can see that at those intensities, there's motion that we can observe. Okay. We can take a movie um, of the retina by taking a stack at many different levels and, and reconstruct the entire volume of the tissue. And then we can turn it on its side. And in that case we would see is this moving, in this case, the ultrasound stimulus is coming from above, delivered kind of right in the center of that field, and the white bar flashing on and off of the ultrasound on and off. And probably you can see that there's some motion of the, uh, of the, the tissue downward in the um, you know, direction of the, um, 
the uh, the ganglion cells, which are at the bottom, photoreceptors at the top, and the array at the bottom is where we would uh, typically record from. So this shows us that you know, there is a mechanical effect. Um, this almost certainly comes from radiation pressure that is being delivered down onto the, uh, the retina from above. Okay. So we can analyze that movie a little bit more by taking a cross section through that volume and you know, looking, um, looking at exactly what happens over a millisecond time scale. So what I'm showing you here is these lines are the membranes of the, of the cells and the x-axis here is showing time. So the, the y-axis is just a single uh, cross section through the, uh, th through, through the retina and the x-axis is time. When the ultrasound turns on and off, this lateral movement here that you can see it's, uh, is uh, up and down, uh, and vertical on this plot, but uh, is uh, the membranes moving back and forth and then recovering over time. When further analyzing this movie, we can see that the onset of ultrasound, there is a very fast displacement with a time constant of less than five milliseconds or so. Then at the offset of ultrasound, there's this uh, relaxation with a fast and a slow component over time. Mm -hmm. So those are the mechanical effects that we can observe. So we wanna know whether or not those mechanical effects are really related to the, um, to the activity. So what I'm showing you here is further analysis of this movie to show a vector field of displacement. Okay, so now you're looking down on the plane of the retina. So this is the fluorescence image here. And by tracking the movement of you know, each of the membranes here, we can make a vector field, which shows at each point, what is the direction and the magnitude of the displacement. Okay. We can analyze the magnitude of that displacement and we can plot it relative to the ultrasound intensity by varying the power and measuring the displacement at different powers of intensity. And you can see over the range we're using it, it's kind of like a linear range. The more intense the stimulus, the greater the, the displacement. And then in the same plot, we can plot the uh, displacement that, uh, uh, that we observe for this particular uh, experiment experiments. So now this is a log scale of power that I'm showing, whereas this was a linear scale. And so we can just plot the displacement in black, and we can also plot the normalized firing rate that we can observe. Now we can plot the firing rate versus the displacement. So here now plotting these two curves relative to each other, the firing rate on the y-axis, the displacement on the x-axis. So we can see that the firing starts to occur when we see very small displacements on a scale of uh, submicron. Okay. So you know, overall, this indicates that the activity and the displacements are occurring at about, at about the same time. Uh, comparing to other results where people have done experiments with individual cells you know, poking on them with a probe, they see gating of mechanosensory channels and uh, mechanosensory activity that occurs uh, on a submicron scale. And so this is all consistent with, uh, with um, this mechanical displacement driving the activity. Now, even though we're showing displacement here, I want to point out that the, the key sort of uh, variable that is sensed by the biological tissue is not like exactly displacement, but it's strain, which I'll explain a little bit more in, in just, just a second, which is how the displacement changes over space. Okay. So now looking at this displacement vector field again, so let's consider that uh, the sensor is going to be some small element like a single ion channel in a membrane. Okay? That ion channel is going to be very, very small on the scale of this displacement. If the tissue was to be displacing uniformly in one direction, you know, like the entire bulk moving exactly the same amount, then there would be nothing for this channel to sense because everything, all parts of it are moving the same, right? They wouldn't sense any different. In order for this channel to actually sense something occurring, it really has to sense a different in displacement. displacement. You know, one side of the channel moving less than the other, effectively you know, stretching apart or squeezing the channel. And that could potentially you know, pull molecules closer together, uh, far, uh, farther apart, stabilize certain uh, uh, um, uh, conformations. And so it's really likely this gonna be this, this change in displacement that matters. This change in displacement or the spatial derivative of displacement is the strain. So if we consider the spatial, uh, uh, consider this displacement as a vector field. So by that, I mean that the displacement is a vector 
let's say you call it with an X, Y, and Z component. Here I'm just showing X and Y, there'll also be a Z component. But that there's a vector for every location in space. So at each X, Y, and location, there's a different X, Y, and Z uh, vector uh, representing the displacement field. If we, what we wanna do is compute how that displacement vector field changes over space, compute the spatial derivative. I'm not really gonna be analyzing this, I'm just gonna be stating what, what the object is that is likely to be important. And, and that's the strain, uh, the strain field. Uh, which, is, which is effectively a, a, a tensor field. So there's different ways to measure strain. This is the infinitesimal strain tensor. But what it means is that, um, uh, you know, at a given location, right, what you wanna consider is as you move in X, how much does the displacement field change in X? So here, as you move, let's say in this direction, in the X direction here, how does this displacement vector change in X? You can also ask, as you move in X, how much does displacement vector change in Y? If it points in, in this direction here and it points in this direction here, that means it's changed a lot in Y as you moved in X. Mm -hmm. So you can ask how the displacement vector changes in X, Y, and Z for each direction of X, Y, and Z. So that gives you nine components. How does it change in X? How does the X component change in X? How does the Y component change in Y? How does the Z component change in Z, et cetera? And so that, that um, um, you know, nine coefficient object would be the strain field. And that's really what's going to be important because it's likely going to be that things like ion channels really only care about strain in one direction, maybe not another, right? And what they care about is you know, a difference in, um, in displacement uh, uh, in, in one direction, one component of that displacement field as you move in one direction. And in general, we don't, don't know all of what that is, but that is likely the variable that is going to be important. So rather than thinking about displacement, it's, it's likely going to be important to think about strain and how that, that causes, uh, how that changes with ultrasound. So do you have the, uh, the Z vector in your images? They're, they're 2D, right? So. Yes, so we have all of that information. The, the, the difficulty is, is that since it's a spatial derivative of something that is already a, a change uh, over over time, things start to get noisy. And so we've done a little bit of, of those analyses. We, you know, we could pool over larger, um, uh, larger regions. And so it's something that we could anal analyze, but I think we want better data. There are actual um, um, uh, biological strain sensors. So Miriam Goodla Goodman's lab has, um, uh, has um, uh, used them. Uh, basically, you know, a, a molecule that will, based on whether it gets stretched or not, um, change its fluorescence. And that wouldn't necessarily give you all of the components of this, of this strain tensor, but it would tell you the local strain uh, in the region of that molecule. And, and sorry, one more question. With your recording system, you have you know, an array of electrodes. Can you look at local strain tensors and correlate that to individual cells in the array? Or are yeah. you mostly looking at total? We could potentially do that. What we would really want to do is rather than use the electrical activity measurement that comes from the array, you know, we can measure using calcium imaging or voltage sensitive dye imaging activity in individual cells. And so really the ideal experiment that we would want to do and we're planning on doing is to use that very local measurement of activity from calcium or voltage sensitive dye, and then use the motion caused by ultrasound to measure the strain field in different directions and then try to correlate the two together. Okay. so. Um, the evidence we have so far is that these, these mechanical effects, and we're certainly thinking about radiation force as, a, um, as the important physical, uh, physical effect, physical mechanism. There's another uh, variable, a parameter rather, that we can use to distinguish between different mechanisms, and that's the frequency dependence. It's known that cavitation, radiation force, and temperature have different frequency dependence. Cavitation uh, decreases as the acoustic frequency increases. It's... Uh, proportional to the one over the square root of the frequency, whereas radiation force uh, being um, proportional to the attenuation coefficient alpha times the intensity divided by the speed, it's proportional to the acoustic frequency okay? because the uh, uh, attenuation coefficient will go up with acoustic frequency. So radiation force will increase with higher frequency, cavitation will decrease. 
temperature also will increase because the uh, absorption will increase with acoustic frequency. So acoustic frequency won't really distinguish between radiation force and temperature, but it will distinguish between cavitation and radiation force and temperature. So by changing the acoustic frequency, just doing the same experiment with uh, at, at different frequencies, we found that higher frequencies uh, higher acoustic frequencies are, are more effective. So the threshold for intensity is much lower for high acoustic frequency in the retina. So that really rules out cavitation as a mechanism and it implicates either radiation force or, um, or temperature. We can also, um, in, a greater, uh, in greater detail, use a model of the radiation force to predict the firing. So based on our transducer, we can make a model of what the radiation uh, force, force is, and then just feed that radiation force through a, a simple sigmoidal function that we can fit. And that one model, based on the known relationship of radiation force with acoustic frequency, can capture the results of all of our experiments across, across frequencies, some over multiple cells. So this these are not separate functions fit to each acoustic frequency. This is just one function fit across all frequencies. And to us, this really strongly impl implicates radiation force as the physical variable that's uh, driving the effects in the retina. The fact that we see motion and this, this model accounts for the results. So now I want to answer the, uh, the, and the correlation is very high. So now I want to answer the question that, uh, that you posed earlier, what are comparisons to in vivo experiments look like? So I want to use uh, data from, uh, from Kim, uh, Kim's lab. So this is taken by graduate student uh, Patrick Yi, which, who we've also collaborated with in our retinal experiments that, uh, that I just talked about. Okay. So the experiments that she's, that she's done is to take an awake behaving mouse, and I'll just give a brief summary of them, to, uh, to take a transducer and, and put it over the region of the motor cortex, and then sort of measure in a whole animal way uh, the output of the animal instead of the output of a, of a little piece of tissue. Uh, the, uh, the muscle twitches of the mouse, which can be generated by ultrasound stimulation, and measured with a technique called electromyography, which measures the electrical activity in muscles. So the experiment is very simple. I stimulate over the, the motor cortex region and measure muscle twitches. And so what they've found is the opposite of what we found in the retina. So what they have found is that lower frequencies are more effective. So by changing frequencies, now this is in somewhat of a different range uh, 1.4 to 2.9 mega, uh, megahertz, although we've included those ranges in the retinal experiments. So they found that here's the intensity axis on the, uh, the intensity axis down here. And this is the, the, um, the probability of muscle twitch on the Y axis, that lower frequencies are more effective, higher frequencies are less effective. Okay, so there's a, a somewhat of a mystery here, uh, potentially just different mechanisms, potentially just different physical effects. Okay. So, uh, so in this case, you know, they found that that lower the lower uh, the efficacy of lower frequency instead uh, implicates uh, uh, different mechanisms uh, such as cavitation. Uh, also, it correlates with what's called particle displacement, just the, the expected movement of particles from ultrasound. So, cavitation would be consistent with their results. So. Thinking about, you know, trying, how do you put these two kinds of uh, experiments together? So we see that higher frequencies are, 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 are more effective. The threshold is lower. So they see that the threshold is higher in, um, um, with, uh, with higher frequencies, although they didn't go up to the very high frequencies that, that we tried. Okay. So now, is there any way that we can potentially unify these results? No, we don't really know, but I just want to raise an issue that that's something that needs to be uh, considered. Okay, so if you have a focused transducer that is limited by diffraction, then the spatial distribution is going to depend on the frequency. Okay, so uh, measuring the effects of the transducers that that were used in their experiments, and we've used these transducers as well. You can measure a certain spot size at, at one acoustic frequency and a higher acoustic frequency, if they're both diffraction limited, will, will create a smaller spot. Okay. And an even lower acoustic frequency, like a half megahertz, will create a larger spot. So there's a, a potential additional variable as you vary, vary the, the frequency. It's one that potentially can be controlled for. It would be difficult to stimulate at a you know, half megahertz with a very small spot, but it would be more straightforward to stimulate with high frequencies with larger spots. 
by choosing a less focused transducer. So the, the, attention, uh, the additional variable is that the size of simulation may change with the, um, with the acoustic frequency. Okay. Now, in some cases that may not really matter, but depending on the size of the neural structure, it may, ma structure, it may ma matter a lot. So this is a mouse brain compared to the retina. And this would be the field stimulated by a half megahertz uh, ultrasonic transducer of the type that was used. Uh, it would activate an area of neural tissue that would be much larger than, than in the retina. The retina isn't only this, this narrow thickness here, okay? So let's consider just theoretically what would be the effect of different acoustic frequencies and different spot sizes with a different size target structure. So let's imagine that there's a very small target structure like the receptive field of a retinal ganglion cell over just a couple of hundred microns or so. And here we're only considering the effect of radiation pressure, which would go up with acoustic frequency. So a higher acoustic frequency like 2.9 megahertz would cause a larger effect. And so you would predict from that for the small target structure that the normalized response, let's say, would be greater for a high frequency than low frequency. If, however, you consider a large target structure over a few millis, uh, millimeters or so, then uh, focus 2.9 megahertz would only activate a small portion of it. Whereas even though at any one, one particular point, the low, megahertz, the, the low frequency stimulus would have a smaller effect because of the integration across this target structure, the effect overall might be greater. So integrating across this larger area, low frequency might end up having a larger effect. And what's, one must also consider the effect that the stimulus isn't maybe localized right over the target structure, it's off target a little bit. Okay. Taking this case here, if the target structure would be here at this uh, place of spatial integration indicated by the, the gray bar here, the focus transducer in any one spatial location might have a larger effect at high frequency, but somewhat away from the focus, the lower acoustic frequency because it has a wider spread would have a larger effect. Okay. What we did was to see if we could account for the in vivo results from, uh, from Patrick with uh, really playing with the location of the transducer relative to the target structure. And we found that there's a potential solution if the target structure was a little bit off axis. So you could potentially fit the, their expense, experimental results with a radiation force model if the higher acoustic frequency is more localized and really doesn't activate the target structure as well. Now, I wanna be very clear that I'm not suggesting that this radiation force model can account for, uh, or rather is the responsible mechanism in the, in the in vivo experiments. We just don't know. It could potentially, if the stimulus was off axis from the target structure, and it really points to the importance of really knowing exactly where the ultrasound stimulus is relative to the target structure. Okay. And for controlling for these variables such as, uh, such as spatial scale. Okay. Once again, you know, it, it could have potentially been this. You know, of, of, it of course could have been that they're really different mechanisms. But in order to really validate which it is and which it's not, one needs to, to control for all these spatial variables. So I want to spend the last few minutes talking about the possible biophysical mechanisms of ultrason ultrasonic neurostimulation. Okay. And what is the, 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 the biological you know, thing, the property that is, that is the sensor? Okay. There are a lot of different potentials. Really, just about all of the mechanisms I talked about in the, in the mechanisms of neurophysiology lecture could potentially play a role. There could be a direct effect on capacitance. So experiments from Merritt Madouk's lab, from Martin Prieto, measuring the effect of capacitance uh, on a lipid bilayer show that ultrasound can change the capacitance. Although this was not an ultrasound paper, experiments from Mikhail Shapiro, which I believe you're, who I believe you're hearing from later in the, in the course, using infrared light shows that infra, infrared light through thermal effects can change the capacitance of cells and be a mechanism of neurostimulation. Certainly mechanosensitive ion channels could be sensing mechanical strain through radiation force. And as I mentioned before, it might just not be mechanosensitive ion channels. It could be other 
other types of ion channels that are not typically thought of as kind of sensitive because when their membrane is just, the membrane in the environment is disturbed enough, many or maybe all channels may have some kind of sensitive properties. Aspects like synaptic vesicle fusion, the snare complex that links the vesicles with the membrane and is the biosensor that senses calcium and causes fusion. Either vesicles themselves or any of these proteins may be sensors that are influenced by ultrasound. Because of these effects, again, may be different in different systems, it's really important to do experiments in multiple systems and compare the results. I'll tell you about some results from Miriam Goodman's lab uh, done by Jan Kubinek, who you're also hearing about later in the course, you're hearing from later in the course, uh, collaboration uh, with, uh, with, with my lab and hers. Uh, Jan, Jan did the experiments uh, in Miriam's lab. So these are on the worm C. elegans, very different system, but one with great genetic control where you can pull out channels and put them back in. So what's happening here is an ultrasound transducer is being focused onto a worm that's crawling around in a dish and the response that's being measured is as the worm control uh, as the worm crawls whether it uh, pulls back whether it reverses its crawling based upon the ultrasound stimulation and it's in a similar sort of way that that uh, uh, the experiments in kim's lab you know applied a stimulus and then measured a whole animal effect the frequency of it the frequency of these reversals were measured and so the blue response here is a response of a wild type worm. And then various mutants were tested, pulling out the thermosensitive channels or knocking out the mechanosensitive channels because in the worm, these are known. When the thermosensitive channels were removed, the responses were virtually the same, showing that these thermosensitive channels weren't needed whereas the response went away nearly entirely when the mechanosensitive channels in mechanosensory neurons were knocked out. Okay. So it shows that the mechanosensitive channels were required. So beyond that, as a you know, greater way to really make a match between the stimulation properties and the known biophysical properties of the channel, not just saying that this channel is required, so Jan then changed the pulse rep repetition frequency because the frequency response of the mechanoreceptors are known. So the green shows a model of the expected frequency response of the mechanoreceptors based on previous experiments stimulating at different frequencies. And then the black dots show the, um, show the um, uh, response frequency of the worm. So there's a very good correspondence. So this really does support the idea that the effects are mechani mechanical, acting through the mechanosensitive channels in the worm. Uh, Steve, um, what's the basis for a frequency response in those ion channels? So that is a good question. I won't be able to comment on all of the biophysics, but I think basically you can uh, ascribe it to a transient response. So if the channel sensed DC, then if you pulled on it, it would continue to be active as long as you pulled on it, as long as that sort of strain was applied. But if there's effectively a relaxation of the protein, it opens and then shuts. And that can be by various mechanisms, some uh, you know, additional uh, um, 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 you know, other protein, uh, you know, some component of the protein, you know, blocking the pore. Uh, there can be many ways that you can get this uh, e either a relax or sort of a, a relaxation of the, of the pore or another, another part of the, the molecule, of the molecule like side chain, you know, blocking the pore. So if there's this basically transient opening, then it's going to give you this intermediate response, right? So it means that, you know, if you, if you pull on it quickly, it, it closes, but if you, you know, keep on pulling it, it'll open and close, open and close, open and close, open and close. And depending on how fast that relaxation is, that will lead to this intermediate frequent, frequency sensitivity. Right? So although I couldn't really point to what's the, you know, side chain or 
conformational change that causes that intermediate frequency sensitivity. It's it's likely this relaxation of the this in the, this um, uh, this shutoff after uh, after transient in a, a transient activation. Okay, so uh, I also want to mention another result is that beyond the worm, results from Merritt Maduke's lab has shown that ultrasound can activate the mechanism, the known mechanosensitive mammalian channel piezo one. Right? These are these are uh, um, in a system where the channels are expressed in other cells, and you'll probably be hearing more about this work later uh, as a demonstration that ultrasound can activate known mechanosensitive channels. So once again, this doesn't show that it, this is the case in all tissues. Uh, mechanisms may very well be different in different in different systems. Steve, to reference back to the the retina, uh, I'm just thinking about sensing ocular pressure. You know, sometimes you feel pressure behind your eyes. Are there natural and strong mechanosensors within the eye, or I don't know if that's outside your field? Because there sounds... are some mechanosensitive channels that have been found in the retina. The question is, is it really specialized mechanosensitive channels, or is it the ones that are expressed in all cells? All cells have to sense their osmotic pressure and for osmo osmotic regulation, so they all have mechanosensitive channels. And so is it the really super sensitive mechano, me mechanosensors like are in, uh, in mechanosensors in, in the skin, or is it uh, other kinds of sensors? And there are some known mechanosensitive channels in the retina. One thing also to realize that, you know, very, you know, a long known effect is if you sort of gently press at the back of your eye, you can you can see a light, either a dark spot or a light spot. And so this effect of you know, you know pressing on your eye, sort of look away and press on your eye, you can see a little bit of a little bit of a, a dark spot there. Do uh, you know do it with caution, but it's uh, it's not it's not that hard to do. Just look away and, and you know, press and, and, and off to the side, you can see. There's um there are these like uh they're more like anecdotes, but people would say, oh, I would hold an ultrasound you know imaging transducer up to my up to my skull and I would see phosphines. Is there any truth to that? If anyone knows, I, th I think it would be you. Have you tried yeah, it? Imaging, Steve? There's another question. Imaging, yeah, I, I don't know if you know imaging sensors have very brief pulses, and the energy delivered is going to be very much smaller than these these types of effects. I'm not sure about that. Uh, if it's a the usual type of ultrasound transducer and not, you know, there, there are things called like ultrasonic elastography where you actually deliver a force to tissue, which probably has to give her a, give a higher, more prolonged uh, uh, intensity. The, uh, the effect of the, of pressing on your eye, uh, you know, that may be blood flow as well, but we don't really know, but, uh, but there is some known effect of pressure on the, uh, causing a visual disturbance. Okay, so in summary, Ultrasound can be used to deliver information in high bandwidth. Uh, we can be uh, used to create localized changes in sensitivity to the natural input as well. Potentially can be useful for some type of brain machine interfaces in certain cases. And also if you're allowed to use a high frequency, uh, high enough frequency stimulation, if you're not, let's say going through the skull, you can get down to single cell resolution. As to the mechanism, what we've seen is evidence for mechanical effects through radiation force in the retina. We also know that in other systems, ultrasound can activate mechanosensitive channels. So that's one mechanism which has some support, which isn't to rule out other mechanisms in certain cases like cavitation. There have been hypotheses made for intramembrane cavitation where the, the membrane is sort of stably spread apart, spread apart a little bit, changing capacitance. It, it is not, I think, a strong evidence for that but it doesn't rule out these other kinds of mechanisms. Uh, thermal effects potentially as well might play a role, especially using higher acoustic frequencies. So, but there is support for mechanical effects. And there's a lot of unknowns. Whether the mechanisms are different in different tissues, it's not even known whether the direct effect is excitatory and inhibitory. There are many inhibitory neurons in the retina and in the nervous system. And so it's not clear whether in, in any given tissue, ultrasound is activating a cell or it's inhibiting an inhibitory cell, which then causes the disinhibition of a, some other cell, right? We need to do more experiments sort of directly measuring the effects of, uh, of ultrasound on single cells. Uh, Merritt Maduke's lab has done some of those experiments. And in certain cases, you can see that it does decrease spike rate, but these effects may be different in may very well be different in different cells and different tissues.
There are other unknowns such as effects of the large, different effects of the large range of parameters that an ultrasound stimulus can have, such as the effect of pulse repetition frequency. Again, that can be different for different tissues depending on the mechanisms. And important to once again mention the effects of spatial integration. And I think it's really important to know, you know, what is the size of the ultrasound field? What is the location and relationship of that field relative to the target structure and how that target structure is integrating, summing over the stimulus. And I think, you know, these are unknowns, but they're in many ways unknowns that can be addressed with various sorts of measurements. And so I think there's a, a lot of kind of directed focus research that can be done. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, especially the, the list of known unknowns. <laughs> so Steve, I think people can ask you during the discussion, but is there a major direction that you want to take the field? I know you mentioned uh, using GCAMP to look at individual cells or what, what's sort of your grand vision for the future? Yes, I would say the importance of the direct effect on individual cells, the specific relationship between the strain field and the um, the field of activated cells, it will be important to measure. I think that's one thing that we're going to be working on. And, and in, in addition, the uh, biophysical mechanisms. Uh, you know, some of these experiments we might, 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 might do or in collaboration with others, the use of genetic knockout mice is potentially uh, very useful for this, the sorts of things, the molecular strain sensors, 